This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 22, recorded on January 28th, 2011. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and as always, Dixon de Pommier is opposite me. Hello, Vince. How are you, Dixon? Uh, chipper. Chipper. Yep. That's one of the adjectives you use to describe yourself frequently. Indeed. I'm glad you're chipper. I feel, feel good. What are you up to these days? Um, I'm preparing a course for architects and engineers on, in ecology. I'm having lots of fun on it. So right now I'm up to the stage of um, doing my PowerPoint presentations. Where will you teach this course? Wherever they'll let me. <laughs> Why don't you teach it online? I could do that. Uh, I prefer face-to-face, mano y mano, and y mana. Um, to architecture firms and to engineering firms and things like this, people who need to know ecology but already know their sort of mm-hmm. specialty. I think you ought to teach it online. And you do, eh? As a webinar and charge people $39 to attend. Well, you know, Vince, you'll have to show me how to do all that. I think you can you can do that, and uh, then you can offer it as a recording afterwards. You know, uh, we'll talk. And then as while you're giving the webinar, you can have interactivity. You can have questions. I see. It's very interesting format. Anyway... I recommend uh-huh. that. Dixon, last time yes. when we met, which yes. was not too long ago, no. we talked about these very large round we worms. We did, we did. The giant intestinal parasite. parasite. And I put that That's wonderful it. picture of Ascaris yep. from the village in India. And, uh, no, Bangladesh, actually. Sorry, <laughs> in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Yeah. Which was uh, this is where George Harrison went for a while. Did really? you know that? I did not know that. It's microbeworld.org slash twip is where you will find the This Week in Parasitism. And the last episode, 21, right. the giant intestinal worm, Ascaris limbricoides. Look at that bottle of worms. That's a large number of worms. Someone put a comment on the website. Those are some big worms. <laughs> and they are, aren't they? <gasps> that would be another name for them. Some big worm. Some big worm. That's right. Now, how can we improve on this? We can't get any better than that, right? You think so, We're going to huh? get smaller today, aren't smaller we? Smaller is not necessarily bad in terms of goodness. Yeah, yeah, of course. Size is irrelevant. We're probably going to talk about the most important nematode infection that humans has have ever known. Really? Really. Important in, in what sense? Many ways, but primarily politically and socially. Wow. Yeah, you'd never think that nematodes could be political or social. So the ones we've talked about so far don't fall into that category. Yeah, uh, Not the way this one does, as you'll see. And what is this one called? Well, it's a family of worms called hookworm. I bet they're called hookworms because they look like hooks. No, they actually don't. All right, let's back up. I'll have to cut that question. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> leave it. Leave it. No, please, please, Vince, leave it in. I thought they looked like hooks. Well, the male parasite... There are male and female parasites for the hookworms. Yeah. Uh, the male has, um, it looks like a little hand at the end of its uh, tail called a bursa. And inside of that, there's a little spicule that comes out that enables him to grab a hold of the female. Mm-hmm. And when they first saw it, it was curved. It almost looked like a hook. But the other thing they have, which looks like hooks perhaps, are the teeth. And in the head of this parasite. They have teeth? They have teeth. Dixon, are you sure they're really teeth? Well, they call them teeth, well, but they're, they're not. Because there's not a mouth, is it? Uh, there is there a mouth. Of course a there's mouth. a mouth. Of course there's a mouth. But most of the nematodes, in oh, fact, all of the nematodes we've discussed so far, don't have this. So this group alone, the, uh, the Ancelostoma. Uh, the Ancelostoma duodenale. Duodenal. You said that with an Italian accent, yes. Vince. And you know, you were right, because it was first named by an Italian. By an Italian. I can it. say Italian, because I am Italian. There you go. I wouldn't dare say that. 
I can insult myself, and I've been insulted over the years. Have you? Yeah, it's okay. Because you were Irish or Italian? I'm not rather? Irish. I'm not Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I yeah, am Irish. People call me all kinds of names. But. Ah, they shouldn't have. Shame and, on them. And so, how do you say it again? And Celastoma. And Celastoma. Now, stoma means an opening, doesn't That's right. it? That's right. And Ancel means or Anklo. What? Anklo. Ankylostoma. Think of another organism out there that was named Ankylo. Ankylosing spondylitis. It's a disease. It is. I don't know any other uh, ankylosaurs. Yes. It was a dinosaur. And what what was their image of an ankylosaur? Yeah, they had this incredible armor all over them. Correct. Right? Correct. Their body was covered with plates of armor, and they had these huge tails with spikes that stuck out from them, right. which they used to defend themselves, right? So yes. ankyl- ankylosaurs were all over the place. So ankylostoma wow. is... The Similar whole, stuff the inside whole, the mouth of yeah, a nematode. Right. Isn't that interesting? So inside a mouth, they have this armor. Stomas. Wall. They have ankylos. They have ankylos. ankylos. There are two types. They have teeth-like things, and yes. then they have something called cutting plates. Now, do we have a photograph in your book? We have scanning electron micrographs of these things. Let's see. Figure 19.6, scanning EM of head of ankylostoma duodenale. Duodenale. It's got these teeth, right? They call them it teeth. It's a very scary picture. It's a fact, very scary uh, picture. My son used that in his report. <laughs> yes. It's scary. It, it, when you see these for the first time, you don't know what you're looking at. So these are what you call teeth, but are not really teeth, right? Well, they're not derived from the same tissue as right. teeth. But are they used from. for masticating food? Well, we'll we see. will get to that. This is the male here. Is, is, it? Or is it? It's just of the head. It doesn't say... It doesn't have to be a male or a female. They, all bo- they both look the same in the head. No, I was looking at this other, 197, which is a different species. Correct. Nicator americanus. Nicator. So, ankylostoma yeah. and nicator. So, what do you think nicator means? Mm, I don't know what nicator means. It's a Greek word for killer. Wow, American killer. It's the American killer. <laughs> Why do we have two different genera? Oh, uh, well, take a look at the teeth and you'll see. Your teeth, that's it? You classify by teeth? I want, well, I want to know the sequence. Let's classify it by sequence. <laughs> you can do that now. Of course you can. <laughs> but they also are different with regards to the way they look as larvae, but let's not even discuss that. The fact is that there are two major species of this uh, nematode yes. which infect people. But there are others, too. I mean, there's one that infects uh, panthers Mm -hmm. in um, the former country of Ceylon. I guess that's uh, Malaysia now, or Madagascar. No, Malaysia, I think, Malaysia. Um, And that that parasite, even though it primarily infects wild animals, can sometimes infect people, too. So there are three of them, and maybe more than that, even. But um, these have caused huge health problems throughout the world, Vince. Throughout Huge. the world, everywhere. Throughout the tropic and subtropical Ooh, worlds. Okay. Look at this number. Hookworms infect 740 million people in just tropical uh, tropical developing nations. Correct. It's probably more than that, but... Uh, yes, because this book is uh, over five years old, right? Well, that's one thing. And the other thing is that most of these countries don't do the surveys. So these are guesses. Yeah. And we also have them in the U.S., right? We did. Not anymore. Well, there is a smidgen still left. Mm-hmm. But the history of this is really interesting, and that's where I really wanted to direct the uh, first part of this uh, program. Are we going to do one program or two? Two. This has to be a two-program thing. Okay. So, I mean, everybody has to know who lives in this country, at least, the United States of America, how we got to be what we are. Which is nasty. <laughs> no, Vince. Not that not, part. Not nasty. You mean well developed? Well developed. I mean overly developed, basically. Yeah. How we developed our sanitation mm-hmm. programs, how we established public health service. Where does the United States Geological Survey come from? What about all these agencies? Where? What are their origins? And even something as basic as a foundation, in this case the Rockefeller Mm-hmm. Foundation has, as part of its rich history, the uh, unraveling of the life cycle and the prevention of acquisition of this parasite. Hmm. But we can go back before that. This is back in the turn of the century, around uh, 1900. Okay. If we go back before that, what was the biggest event in U.S. history after mm. we gained our independence, Vince? Civil War. Exactly. 
And when did that occur? 1850, mid-1850s, right? Well, I'd, I'd push it up a little bit. Push the it early up. 1860s to the okay. middle 1860s. You okay. see, I'm not very good at history. All right, well, that's okay. You could just look it up. You know, why should you have to commit that to memory? Yeah, it's good to be able to toss <laughs> the. But I agree, you can look it okay. up. Okay, yeah. and what was the Civil War all about? Do you remember that? <laughs> what it was about in the beginning versus the middle of the war it changed a bit. It did, it? did. So in what did it start out it as? A, well, it started out because the, the South had just, you know, this agricultural economy. Yeah. And the North had an industrial economy. Yeah. And, but everything was that came into the country was equally taxed, and the South said, this isn't yeah. fair. We can't make as much money, so we want to get a break on taxes. Uh, they also said something else, too, didn't they? What was the industrial North famous for? It's particularly around New England. Wood? No. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, wood was, of course, one of those issues. But New England. What was their machinery geared for? Uh, paper mills. And? Weapons. And? Cloth. That's right, cloth. Correct. Oh, and they took the cotton from the south and made the cloth. Well, they didn't take the cotton well, from the yeah, south right it. away. They bought the cotton from the south, but right. they... They were not willing to pay the southern farmers the what money they wanted. what they wanted. So the South started selling it to other countries. Namely, well, where did we steal all those inventions from when we uh, gained our independence? England. That's right, exactly. Mm. So here, the, the southern gentlemen, not so gentlemanly, were now offered a much better price for their cotton yeah. by England than the northern industrial states. This sounds like a plot to gain the colonies back again. And and what made cotton farming so profitable for the southern gentlemen, do you think? Uh, they had cheap labor, I think. Oh, cheap. Right. I wouldn't even use that word cheap. I would just say they had free labor. It was free. And where did the labor force come from? From Africa. That's right. Mostly. They had indentured servants, too. But yeah. you could buy your way out of it by simply working for five years on a farm. But the African slaves had no way of buying their way out of this. And in fact, slavery was very prevalent, both in England and in the United States, before we became the United States, during colonial days, right? So we know that Jefferson had slaves, and I'm not sure if Washington had slaves or not, but we know that a lot of other great Americans had slaves, even though they helped to write the independence, you know, the I was just going to say, a little aside, How does we that wrote work? this declaration said, well, men are created equal. Men. See, slaves are not men. Oh, well, you can dehumanize not, them. Yeah, but that's ridiculous, right? Because they're they're black-skinned and they come right, from they, primitive they, cultures. Right. Well, we can throw that away. That's how they justified it. Above, of course it was. In fact, here, they did this marvelous thing where in Europe right. for many years there were right. this caste level of you society bet. where the ones on the bottom were trash, and then there was your royalty on top. Yep. So we came here and said, we're not going to do that because all you guys are the same. We did say that. And then what we? are we doing? And we did the same thing. It's ridiculous. Of course. But I don't want to get political on this part. Oh, but you're going to have to a little bit, because what I want to really bring up is a relationship between disease and politics. Okay, so in the beginning, the Civil War was a war of economics, right? Okay. And the economics revolved around the issue of who will buy my cotton, and for how much. All right. And the northern industrialist says, well, you're going to sell it to us because you're part of this country. And you owe it to us to help the economy. And the Southerners said, but we've been offered better prices in Europe. And so we think we're going to sell our cotton to Europe. That didn't sit well with the Northerners at all. And so they insisted. In fact, they set up uh, barriers, not tariffs yet, but barriers, uh, economic barriers for imports, saying that if, if you export to England, then we will not import the goods that you need in order mm. to run your operations. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about earlier. So you've yeah, got yeah. these horrible yep. things going on between North and South. And the Did the North employ slaves in their industrialization? Sure. Did they? No. Not one. You know why? Because they didn't need them. Because they were using machines to do the work. Okay, machines substitute for slavery. But in the South... There were no machines. There wasn't even the cotton gin then. Why People, not? Why was there this big Because there difference? was no need for it. Yeah. When there's not a need, it doesn't get developed, right? You got it right. Sort so, of like electric cars, right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. So that's the background for the beginning of the Civil War, because once the southern 
plantation owners realized that they weren't going to get their way in terms of price, and the northern industrialists were being very strict with regards to what would be imported from the countries that the southerners were selling their goods to, the, the southerners decided to secede from the Union. And there was a lot of issues over slavery. Always, slavery is a background, okay? So it, not that it didn't play a role, but it wasn't a dominant role in the beginning of the Civil War. So right. the more you read, right. the more you realize it was a war of economics. But interestingly enough, the African slaves <coughs> that were brought to the United States came mostly from West Africa. In fact, they were caught as runaways by African mm -hmm. gentlemen and African kings and African owners of land. These were other African people that were selling subsets of their own people for money to the white slave traders to bring to the United States. They, they had no ethics. So the, if they mm -hmm. didn't cooperate with the white slave owners, sure. there wouldn't be slavery, right? But they did. So there's some guilt on their part, too. But the point I'm raising is that <laughs> in Africa, there were these diseases that were not in our country at all. Ah, ah you see? Now you know what I'm grabbing at, don't you? So you start bringing in these people. Right. And they've got all their intestinal parasites. And they've got filarial parasites, which we will discuss at a later time. These are parasites that are still nematodes that are transmitted by insects. In this case, mm -hmm. uh, black flies and mosquitoes. So one of the big center points for slave trading in the United States was Charleston mm -hmm. in South Carolina. And that became an epicenter for the establishment of a disease that we now call elephantiasis. It causes the uh, lymphatic vessels to block and swell up below the blockage and lymph accumulates in the tissues. And if this happens in your groin, mm -hmm. unilaterally on one side of your groin, one of your legs starts to look bigger than the other. But sometimes it can happen in both legs. And in that case, both legs begin to swell to the point at which they are indistinguishable from an elephant's leg. And that's why the term elephantiasis mm -hmm. came in. So we had what we would call autochthonous elephantiasis established in Charleston and in the surroundings. It's an infectious disease. It is. It's an infectious disease transmitted by mosquitoes. And we had different mosquitoes than they have in Africa, but, with, but they were similarly competent. And what's the agent of the, the disease? The agent is called Wuchereria bancrofti. Oh, it's in this book, well, isn't it? Of course. Well, sure, are we sure. going to talk about we it? We are going to talk about that. But then they had these other intestinal nematodes as well. Mm -hmm. They had Ascaris. They had Trachuris. Of course, everybody had pinworms, so we're not worried about that one. But they also had hookworm. Now, when did the first slaves come into the colonies, I presume, right? Yeah. It was so, in the early 1830s. And then, of course, we knew nothing of infectious diseases. Nothing. Because coke didn't work until the late That's right. 18, 1850s, right? That's right. And by then, we brought all these John diseases. John Snow in. wasn't involved at all in yeah. this until the 1860s, even. Right. So the point is that hmm. we, we, but even if we knew, we'd still do it. Of course. And but the point is, we didn't even screen. We didn't even check people. At we, some point in this country, we oh, started yeah. to check people. Here's right? what we did, though. No, that's not true. What they we did didn't. was they checked for the health of the slave. Yeah. Whether they had all their teeth. As you how know, strong they were. That doesn't tell you if you're infected or not. Of course not. It just says that your immune system is good and you can resist these diseases, yeah. and then they become infections, right? So, so they brought in a variety of parasitic infections. They did, did they bring in any others? Viral, any yellow fever that was already here, probably, right? It was already here, but they probably brought that in as well. Okay. Sure, of course they did. It was a miracle they didn't bring in um, West Nile virus. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Took till the 1900s for exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Dixon. Yes. If a slave came in or a human being was brought in from Africa mm. and they were not healthy, obviously not healthy, what would happen to them? Well, they'd usually die on the way over. Uh, it's a long trip in a boat. It's a very long trip. And they were all laid down like so many logs. Horrible. It was, And they couldn't get up and walk around. No way. They got as many of those people in those boats as they could. So if you have a chance to go to Puerto Rico and get to San Juan and go into the old city which a lot of us have done, uh, you go to the old part of the city and, and you'll notice that the, the, uh, the pavement is not asphalt. Yes. There are these blue bricks mm -hmm. that are laid down. 
They're beautiful, actually. Those were the ballast. From these ships, why did they use those? There? Well, Just every time a slave them. dies, yes. it either makes the ship heavy on one side yeah. or on the other because they throw the bodies over side. Mm -hmm. So as the slaves would die, they would fill in that bunk with ballast to equal the weight. Then when they got to the New World and they sold all their slaves that lived, they would unload the ballast as well hmm. and fill up with goods like rum and bring it all back to mm -hmm. sell it in Europe so that you had these big circles, right? You had yeah, the, yeah. the sugar, the rum, and the slave triangle between Europe and, and the New World. Right. And then eventually that shifted over to cotton. We'll have to ask Alan Dove. He was just in Puerto Rico last week. Great. If so, he saw the blue stones and I've if he got, knows what they are. I have a lot of pictures of them because... You do? I do. I can give you a couple to put up on the net. That would be nice. So the, the moment you look at these stones and you realize what they were, it changes your whole view of what that whole street was about. Wow. You see streets paved yeah. with this. Those were people's lives that you're looking at. So that's part of the tragedy. The other tragedy, of course, was that we introduced a lot of new endemic diseases. Endemic. Notice I said, they're, first of all, they're emerging infections, and then they become endemic. So it, when they were brought here and they're not here before, they become an emerging infection. That's correct. And once they're established, they're endemic. That is exactly right. So this, this and did the, we did we recognize this at the time no. or much later? No, no. I, I want to give you the history of this because how we recognized it established a whole bunch of things. Great. That's what this is a whole bunch of stories about, right? So the audience might be sitting there wondering how I know all of this because I'm sure I'm. I won't tell you how old I am, but I've already done that, so it doesn't really matter. I'm almost, You're 100 years old, right? I'm almost 100 years old. I'm, I'm 71 years old in June, so... Happy I, birthday. Thank you. But the, the point of this... <laughs> not yet. <laughs> you might as well do it now in case I'm not here. You could live another 20 years. I could live... I could certainly live another, especially if I take care of myself take a little care better. care of yourself. I'll try. Thank you, Vince. Podcast but, often. <laughs> this is, if I can still remember all this stuff, right? You're doing a good job. Not bad. So... I spent three years at Rockefeller University. That was my uh, defining moment as a scientist. Mm -hmm. And I met a lot of wonderful people while I was there. And one of the people I met was Norman Stoll, S-T-O-L-L, -L, Norman Stoll. All right. Now, that name might not mean anything to anybody out there. doesn't mean that's anything under to the, me. <laughs> under the age of, let's say, 55 or 60. But if you're a parasitologist mm -hmm. and you're in your 60s or 70s, the name Norman Stoll means something because there was the Stog stall egg counter mm -hmm. and the stall larva counter for hookworm and norman stall was one of the first pioneers to work on hookworm in this country mm. now, i'll get to him in a minute but he used to sure. tell us all of these true stories at lunchtime and we used to sit around with our eyes nice. bugging out that must have been great uh, wouldn't fabulous. you have liked to record those yes of course i would <laughs> of course i would have and he told him in such an eloquent way and he was such a gentleman and a wonderful can man. we get him on the podcast he's no longer alive unfortunately so you're listening to norman stall through my voice now well, you remember some of it right? i do remember some of it and i also have heard a lot of these stories again through the eyes of scholars like for instance peter hotez who is one of our authors on this book, which we will have on this podcast after I finish these one-on-one -on -one sessions. So we'll get some embellishments. You know, last week on TWIV, we interviewed the author of The Panic Virus. Right. And he thanked in the back of the book, Peter Hotez. Because, wow. Because he's involved in autism. Peter has several autistic yeah. children, unfortunately. And he's also an infectious disease epidemiologist he is yes oh yes to the first order and he's a world expert on hookworm and where does he work he works at uh george washington university he's and if you call him he'll answer the phone <sighs> not only that he might even say hello <laughs> All right, good. yeah we're good friends actually does he know so, about hookworm he knows a lot about hookworm in fact when we gave this course at columbia's medical school yeah. peter often came up and gave the lecture on hookworm and when he didn't you did Right. So I learned a lot by just listening to him. Okay. Uh, also, next to trichinella, is this your favorite parasite? Hmm, that's a tough question, Vince. I love them all. <laughs> you love them all. All right. I do. I actually love them all. Okay. So back to the hookworm story. Yeah. So now here we are um, introducing hookworm daily through the slave trade. Mm -hmm. 
because almost all these people had. I don't know how you would introduce it if it's in their intestine, Dixon. Well, are they shedding eggs like all these other worms that we've talked about? They are. We're going to do the life cycle in another podcast. No, we can do it here. I I, I don't know. Give us some biology first before you do the. Sure. But the okay, but the the remember. Let's just keep this on the back burner. We'll we'll come back to this burner. We'll move that pot forward. Right. We're introducing these uh, this disease to the U.S. This parasite. But let's do a little biology because it played a huge role in the history of the united states okay i guess we could go over the life cycle okay let's fast forward to the life cycle let's just talk about that for a moment then this is one of the few infections that is of a um, multicellular origin in this case it's a nematode which you can catch simply by exposing your skin to it to the actual worm yeah now this this is very unusual because your skin is the first line of protection, correct? Sure. It keeps out almost everything. If you pour a virus solution nah. over your skin, nothing happens, you right? You know why, Dixon? Yeah, certainly I do. Why? Because <laughs> there's no receptor molecules on your skin. No, there's a better reason. Oh, and there's no living tissue on the, the surface outer, either. Yeah, the outer layer is it's dead. It's all dead. It's all dead. So That's unless right. you scrape it or cut it. Correct. So there's a, And you do the same with bacteria. 99.9% of them go away, but, but there are a few that don't. Gonorrhea is one of those that doesn't. Well, we have a colony of bacteria. We have many bacteria living on our skin. They help us. In fact, they're probably eating the proteins in the the skin. Well, that's fine because they protect us. Exactly. And did you know it was our biggest organ? What is? The skin. Oh, sure. Of course. We don't even... Many people don't think of it as an organ, but it is. we don't think of it as an organ. It's our largest organ. Isn't that interesting? All right. So you can So this catch is a parasite that actually penetrates the unbroken skin. That's how you get it? You don't ingest it? You do not. You get it by simply sitting on it or standing on it. Wow. That's that is a, unusual. We haven't talked about that route yet. <clears throat> no, we so haven't. Any, any part, if you could lie down on it at night, it would go through your head? Yep. Your You're, arms, your legs, you have back, hair. front. You're a mammal, right? I'm a camel. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I say it every time you say mammal. Why? Because I have that book ingrained in my head. Is a camel a mammal? It doesn't. Yes, the answer is yes. A camel yeah, is a mammal. Yeah. We take the whole book for a kid book to do it. So how do you classify mammals? How do I classify yeah, them? Yeah, what was their characteristics that makes them mammals? Warm blooded. And uh, they b- give birth to live young. And um, they sequence genomes. They have they hair. Stop it. They have hair. They've got hair, Vince. Facial hair. There isn't anywhere. a single mammal that doesn't have hair. Those are the three defining characteristics. Well, I've learned something. There I you got go. two out of them, right? You did. So hookworm takes advantage of hair. Really? They they penetrate your skin via a hair follicle. Oh, huh, interesting. So that's a pore that actually sticks it's through the pore, skin, yeah. and at the bottom of it, there's a circulation. How can they find the hair follicles? Mm. <sighs> I guess they follow chemosynthetic trails. So even if you've cut all your hair off, they can still get into that follicle, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there any hairless humans? There are. Do they have follicles? Yes. Oh, so these guys can still infect them. Of course. So they get on your skin if, you just, if you're just if you physically on top of these Yeah, where guys. did they come from, though? How'd they get in the soil? They're just not sitting there, right? No. They, actually, they are just sitting there. <laughs> but they didn't spontaneously Something put them arise. there in the soil. An egg, probably, right? An egg, probably. An egg, yes. Where did the egg come from? Ah, feces? Of course. It's always feces, isn't always it? Always the feces. Well, in this case, it is. So the, so the slaves came into the U.S. and they... Sanitation was poor sanitation anyway. Sanitation was poor, so there's eggs in the... They're passing eggs of soil. hookworm, ascaris, trichuris... And several other parasites. So they had them all. Hmm? They had them all. They also had schistosomes, by the way. They had schistosomes. All right, we haven't talked about schistosomes, but we will. Yeah. That's another parasite that can penetrate the unbroken skin, but you need it in fresh water. So when these these are small worms, you can't see them, or you you could see them. Cannot see them. Really, they're that small. They can penetrate a hair follicle fins. All right. So these are multicellular worms. They are. Round worms. Yes. Ne- nematodes. Correct. And they penetrate the hair follicle. So they do. these worms have grown from an egg in the soil. So they don't need anything but the soil to do this. That is which correct. is similar to some of the other worms that we talked about. Yeah, if you have hookworm and you deposit some feces in a container for diagnosis, yes. for instance in a lab, and the technician inadvertently forgets that container for three days, when they open it up, the larvae will be there, not the eggs. The hatch. 
Right. Okay. They will have developed from a single cell stage to a larva in three days. That's right. incredible. Yeah, it's quick. Very quick. So in three days, if you deposit your stool in soil, and now it depends on what kind of soil. Really? Yeah, if it's dry clay soil, nothing happens. Larvae die. What is it they need from the soil to uh, moisture grow? Moisture? Moisture. Not dry. Hmm? So in the southwestern U.S., you're not going to have this disease. Never have it, right. But in the southeast, in several places in the southeast, yeah. and you know, the, there's this thing called the Piedmont. Yes. Below which, towards the ocean, sandy loamy soils. Yes. Above which, hard-packed clay soils. How do you think we learned that? That's a hint. This parasite taught it to us. It did. It taught us what? The geography of these regions? Oh, that's correct. Really? Because, Are you sure? Because they're only found in certain ones. So we went from the, the range <laughs> of the worm to the geography. Yes. Once you've mapped out where hookworm is, it fell into a pattern I that see. matched where the soil types were. So that was a revelation because before that we had no idea. That soil yeah. types and the physical environment is related to the acquisition of a parasite. So the Northeast doesn't have hookworm. Never did? Nope, never did. Too, too hot, hot? Too cold? Too and cold. not enough moist soils. So in the appropriate so, in the appropriate environments, this is a year-round infection? Yeah, so where did all the slaves go? They all went to the south oh. where it's nice and hot and moist. So all these sandy, loamy soils filled up with, with feces which contaminated the environment and allowed the transmission of hookworm almost year-round. And how, what was the preferential portal of entry besides the hair follicle? What part of the body? The bottom of the feet? No, they'll crawl up from the bottom of the foot looking for a hair follicle, uh, and eventually they'll find them on the knuckles of your, of your toes. I see. And you can't feel this, right? Not at all. You have no clue. Not the first time. Uh, several rounds of penetrations over a couple of years, yeah. and you start to develop a hypersensitivity to this. It's actually got a name. It's called plumber's itch. And that's because plumbers encountered fecal matter in their pipes. Not necessarily. No, no, I'll get to that story later. But All just right. just know that it became known acroni acronistically. Right. So um, it gets through your hair follicle, and then where does it go? We can complete the cycle. and then It you... now undergoes the ascaris life cycle. Right. Aha, uh -huh. so it, the circulation takes it to the lungs. So it gets in the blood from this uh, hair yeah. follicle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes yeah, right yeah. into your bloodstream, really? It does. It so does. it's very small. It is. And it gets to your lungs? Gets to your lungs, penetrates out into the alveolar space. Right. It sounds like Ascaris crawls across the epiglottis. It's and swallowed. You swallow it, oh my goodness. And now it develops to an adult. In your intestine. Small intestine. Mm -hmm. Where did Ascaris develop? Small intestine. Same thing. Where did Trachuris develop? Large intestine. Correct. So, the moment the worm develops to an adult, guess what happens? Now, in the intestine, it's an adult, right? Yes. Begins laying eggs. Nope, can't. It has to mate first. Well, I assumed that becoming an adult was no, no. synonymous with mating. <laughs> the moment it becomes an adult, it mates. Okay. Now, sometime shortly after that, it starts to lay eggs. But it also has to feed. How, many, how much time is this involved? Well, the whole life cycle is about six weeks, eight weeks. All right, weeks. from the penetration to making eggs. Right. Okay. How do they stay in the intestine? Now, they, the big worms swim, right? The biggest worms swim, and they can actually form an S-shape and push themselves up yeah. against the wall of the intestine and stay that way. Okay, and these guys? These are too small for that. These are like C. elegans size, right? Right, exactly. So, but they have these cutting plates, Vince, and these teeth. Oh, they grip into the wall? They grip onto a villus. Uh, and then they just float in the breeze? They float in the breeze, but they also mate at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the male and the female worms remain attached. And like I said, the male has this bursa that he grabs onto the female with, mm -hmm. and then he inserts his spicules. Mm -hmm. That allows him to stay a hold of the female, and then he starts to fertilize the eggs. Right. Inside the female? Yes. Okay. And but they're, they, but they're, they're doing two wonderful things at the same time. They're mating and they're feeding continuously. And what do they feed on? Good question, Vince. For many, many years, we never knew. But what do you think it is? So there are two possibilities. There's, there's something in the lumen or there's something in the wall that they're gripping onto. Uh, or there's a third possibility. <laughs> <laughs> they're feeding on the wall. 
The wall itself. Yes. And that's the one that's right. That's the one that's correct. So but at the, the same villas. time... They're gripped onto the villas, they're, gri- right? they're gripped onto the villas, but they're not just gripped onto it. They're actually cutting it off. Chewing. By right, going back and forth with their cutting plates oh or teeth. Oh, my goodness. And then they're, they're not just chewing, though, because they don't have any teeth inside to chew with. They swallow that big piece of villas tissue that they were grabbed onto. But don't they fall off when they chew off the piece of villas? No, 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 because then they go down below that and they hang on. Because what Mm -hmm. happens is the villa starts to bleed. Yeah. And the blood, first of all, the tissue of the villa serves as the food for the worm, so it digests Mm -hmm. all of that. And then the blood starts to go through the lumen of the intestine for the worm, and they have this very large esophageal bulb, esophageal bulb, which they use to pump the blood, your blood, through their entire intestinal wow. tract and out into the lumen. They don't use the blood at all? We didn't say they didn't use the blood at all. They're using the blood for something. We think that this is a micro aerophilic worm, and they're using the oxygen in the blood. What does micro aerophilic mean? Well, as a microbiologist, Vince, you should know that there are <laughs> two kinds of organisms, anaerobes and aerobes. Right. And if they only need a little bit of oxygen, they're called mm-hmm. a micro aerophil. And if you give them a lot of oxygen, is it bad for them? We don't know that. I don't know the answer. But the gut tract can't give you a lot of oxygen, but it can give you some. Okay. So the sum that we can measure is from, so they get it from, from the, the blood. blood. Mm-hmm. And the rest is wasted. They just throw it away outside into the lumen of the how, intestine. How do they get oxygen out of the blood? Do they break the cells? Well, it's a. It, how does the oxygen come out of the red cells when it goes through your capillaries, Vince? I don't know, Dixon. Well, you know, you have to know this. You have to know this. Carbon dioxide, which is also a gas, has a higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen. Yes. So when when oxyhemoglobin encounters a high concentration of carbon dioxide, the oxygen comes comes right out. And then it goes through the the membrane. And the CO2, right. So that's probably what's going on in the gut tract of this worm. There's a high concentration buildup of CO2 along the gut tract. Mm -hmm. It exchanges with the O2, and the O2 goes into the worm to supply it with energy. Because these are very active worms, Vince. They're very active. So when they digest, when they chew away the whole villus, they get to the base, the crypt, what do they do? Switch to another villus? They do, Vince. They do. But you should ask another question. You know, blood clots, right? It does. How does this worm prevent that? Uh, I bet they have an anticoagulant. Boy, do they. Are they a pharmacopoeia? Like they are. This this is the first order of pharmacopoeia (laughs) you can possibly imagine. Peter Hotez is a champion for this kind of research. He was at Yale at the time that he worked out most of this. And uh, there are two major blood um, uh, uh, proteins which this parasite can interfere with that has something to do with clotting. Mm Mm-hmm. And by interfering with two rather than one along the clot cascade, the parasite ensures the fact that the blood will never clot. Now, medical leeches only have a protein that interferes with with clotting blood at one of the uh, Mm -hmm. positions of the cascade. This one blocks it in two different ways. So this is like a backup. This has huge application. If we could clone the genes, which they've done, And if we can express the proteins, which they've done. And if we could use these in a situation where the medical leech anticoagulant is Mm -hmm. not very effective, uh, you'd have yourself a nice anticoagulant here. Now, how many such worms would you have in your intestine? Depends on how many you stepped on. So if you stepped on just a few, you just have a few in your intestine. This is correct. And that's it. They're not going to get any They're not going to reproduce any further. But I, I would assume there have been individuals with many, many, many worms in you their intestine. You have assumed correct. In so, fact, you can have so many worms that you will die. You get anemic, I presume, because you're bleeding so much? That's number one. Now, the thing about this thing is that the parasite, when it moves from one villus to another, yes, the anticoagulant that is injected into the site remains. Mm-hmm. And that villus continues to bleed for three more days before it repairs itself. Why is that? Because the anticoagulant is still working. No, but why does the worm want to do that? It well, I'm, not, I'm not sure the worm wants to do anything. I don't think they have conscious will to do it. No, I, I meant to but say this is what why happens. it has it evolved to this state. Is there some purpose for the bleeding to continue? And I can't right. answer the question. You're right in, in I don't the correct have me. the answer to okay. the question. All I do know is that this is what happens. And in fact... Um, Ancelostoma duodenal, 
causes 10 times more bleeding because they extract more blood than the uh, Nicator americanus. All right, there's a difference in the amount of blood that each one extracts per worm so if per you, day. So if you just had a few worms in you, you wouldn't notice the blood coming. Ever. But if you had many, many worms, you could see it in your stool probably. You could see it in the color of your stool because yes. it would turn a brown, dark, dark brown because of the uh, hematuria yeah. that you've got. And you would get anemic, I, I presume. Right away. But it's a simple anemia, Vince. What does that mean? It means it's iron deficient. You can correct it by supplementing with iron. Why? Why does that correct it? Because you're losing red blood cells, you are. right? So how does iron correct You're also it? losing protein. Yeah. So you, you might develop a proteinemia, but you're, you can correct the, the, um, the uh, pale red blood cell syndrome mm -hmm. that you get from this, okay, by simply supplementing with iron. Okay. So there were many places in Africa, for instance, which had lots of hookworm, but no hookworm anemia. Right. So they could do a decent day's work. And what do you suppose the difference in that village versus another village was? Iron in the food or water or something? Uh, neither one. Mm -hmm. Their vessels were made out of iron. They cooked in it. So oh, they're, they're cooking vessels, not, right. not their blood vessels. No, 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 they're cooking vessels. <laughs> so they would prepare their food in iron vessels, which, of course, rusted every day. Yeah. A little bit of iron would get into their food, and, of course, they were supplementing their diet with iron. Interesting. And who figured that out? Yeah, well, epidemiologists eventually, once yeah, they worked story. all of this stuff out. But this life cycle was worked out by an Italian. And yeah, by the name of? Dubini. Yeah, Dubini. Uh, Dubini. 1843. I have a question. Please. Um, so you said you can die of if you, this, if you, you have can. too many words. Why, if you're a why small you die? child, well, you'll die from lack of oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, any other causes of death? Probably not. No. If you don't die, what's the what other things could happen? You to end you? up as um, you get, a, the poster child for Deliverance. You remember the movie Deliverance? I, I didn't. didn't I, see I that saw movie. it, but you know what? We're going to put it up on the web. I don't remember it. Uh, that's okay. It's <laughs> it's with Burt Reynolds. Yeah. Right and John Voight. And there was a scene in the movie which is riveting. It shows the dueling banjos. Okay, mm -hmm. it had a guitar and a banjo actually. The banjo player was this skinny, weird-looking man-child. Mm -hmm. It was a man, but he was only as big as a child. Is that because he had hookworm? Yeah. It causes stunted, stunted, stunted growth. Okay. So that's another effect of this. You mentioned something in Africa. You said in some villages they were too weak to work. Yes. Is because, that another effect? Because they weren't using iron vessels. Yeah, and, and so that's another effect of the infection. Oh, yeah. Without enough carrying capacity in your red cells, you're going to be weak. So that's the main reason there are, you don't have enough oxygen. Yeah, there's a third that, well, you were talking about causes of death. But not death. If you don't die, <coughs> what else can it cause? A long-term oh. chronic illness. And the most insidious thing it causes, mm -hmm. of all of the diseases that it causes, is a permanent loss of IQ. Is that right? That's right. From, we'll, from having suboptimal oxygen levels. Nah, we'll get to the reasons. And even if you get rid of the worm and restore oxygen levels, you still have this op IQ loss? Yes, and even if the weight gain then resumes normal. Yeah. At a normal rate. And why is this, Dixon? I will explain okay. all of that. So I think that's enough biology. You all right. get back to your story. <laughs> so here we are back in the, uh, the late 1850s. Right. The South is now thoroughly convinced that the North will never relent in their quest for cheap cotton. The South is not a food-raising nation, because all of the land that they set aside is set aside for raising cotton, wherever they could, which you can't eat. So you have to trade for what you can eat. So where does that come from? It comes from Europe. Mm-hmm. The northern regions of the United States didn't raise food either, so most of our food was coming from either the, the developing Midwest, all right? So we were, we were in the Midwest, and we were raising lots of different crops. And the Mississippi River was the conduit to mm -hmm. take those crops and distribute them throughout the world even. But in general, um, the South was committed to supporting Europe's demands because they got a great price for it. And the slave trade just continued to feed into this issue. Until one day, of course, as you know, in April, I guess it was 1862, the Civil War broke out. 
It was in Virginia. And, of course, everybody came out to see it because they thought it was going to be over with in two days. They did. They actually sat up on the hills and watched the North fight the South. Four years later, almost to the day, the war ended. So who won the war, Vince? Uh, North. Correct. The Union. They did. Any guesses why? Uh, because Lincoln finally got this really good general <laughs> named Ulysses S. Grant. Correct. To replace? To replace, I forgot the guy McC before. McClellan. McClellan, McClellan, who was McClellan. inept, right? Totally. The story of U.S. Grant is wonderful. If you go on the circle line, you will I'm sure. hear it. Yeah, I'm sure you will, because his tomb is right down over yeah. there. So as you pass the tomb on the circle line, right. you hear the story of U.S. Grant, yeah. which, and he got his initials in a very interesting way. They're not really his name. <laughs> no. U.S. Um, came from something else, but that's another story. Do you know story. who his biggest supporter was, by the way, after the war? Um, a philo philanthropist whose name is escaping me. No, Mark Twain, actually. Was it Mark Twain? Yep. Because uh, Grant, after the war, was totally ineffective as a president. Right. He one was, of our worst presidents. He was a terrible president. He retired, and, and then he lost the, his kid gambled and lost all his money, and his father paid it off, and then he was broke, and someone came to help him and said, why don't you write was, a book? Mark Twain was one Was that of Mark people. Twain? Yeah, he was, but uh, he was also an alcoholic. I mean, yeah. not, not Mark Twain, but uh, Ulysses Grant. And Grant. so people said, our, president, our former <coughs> president should not be living like this. No. And so they took care of him, and when he moved to New York... Right. New Yorkers said, we should honor a former president. You betcha. He wrote this book, and it sold. He said, I'll get it to you. He did it, and the book sold very well. Yep. And then he died, and, he, and his wife had the money to live. Right. And then, so they built him this tomb. It's a good story. And on a sunny day, if you drive by, you can see him sitting out front. <laughs> you can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that saying comes, as long as you're up, get me a grant. <laughs> That's about a scotch, though, unfortunately. So... The real reason why the that's not why they won the war. No, though. that's not why. I'm they sorry, won the folks, war. for that diversion. Well, why was the North losing the war? Not because of ineptness necessarily. You know, it's extremely difficult to fight a war of attrition in the country of the people that are fighting you. Yeah. So most of the battles were in the South. Ninety percent. Yeah. And so, who knew the territory better than the people living sure. there? So there was a difference between the North and the South in terms of many things, okay? The guns that they used. I mean, the North had this big industrial machine. They should have been able to wipe you out in one blow, but they didn't because the Southern troops got support from England. They got firearms and lots of provisions and stuff. But one of the things they didn't get from the, from the from English was uh, leather for their shoes. But you know what? The Southern troops didn't need it because they just went out and hunted shot deer, mm -hmm. and made their own clothing out of it. Yeah. Now, you ever wear anything about uh, made out of deer skin, Vince? No. What the difference is between um, deer skin and cow skin, mm -hmm. which you'd call leather, okay, is that one is very thick, one is very thin. The deer skin is very thin compared to cattle. And the other thing is the north had hemlocks, mm -hmm. lots of hemlocks. It's a northern tree. Mm -hmm. And the bark of the hemlock contains tannins. And the tannins are then extracted from the bark and used in tanning factories. That's why they're called tannins. Mm -hmm. And they tanned this leather. Why do you think they tanned it? Make it water repellent and tough? Tough. Tough? The word tough is there. So you make a boot out of that leather. It'll last a it's while. It's almost indestructible. Yeah. You make a boot out of deer skin. What Falls happens? apart? It does, actually. Mm -hmm. So now the southern troops are running around all over the place with holes in their shoes, Vince Hookworm can go right through that. I would think so. They can. And it's all over because of it's the... It's all over the place. And if you were being shot at, what would you do? I would <laughs> I would run and defecate at the same time. <laughs> That's what I would do. I can guarantee you. My pants would be spoiled. So these soldiers were picking up hookworms. They were, and the northern troops were not. Wow. Because they had good shoes. Mm -hmm. Primarily. That's one of the stories. Now, this is... Semi-apocryphal, okay? Hard to, Semi hard to document, though, right? Very hard to document, except for the ill health of the southern troops. We know they were in ill health? We do, we do. They were anemic, they were anemic. Hmm, anemic. Now, they could have also had malaria, because there was a lot of malaria mm -hmm. throughout the south, too. Guess where that came from? Africa? Gee, it must have come from Africa, also. Wow. Yeah, so Africa brought a lot of things here that we didn't want. Because we had the mosquito here already? <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. We already had an awful lot of mosquitoes. So, so these things were preying on the health of southern troops. Mm -hmm. 
The northern troops were suffering too, don't get me wrong. They were suffering from malnutrition and exposure and all kinds of other things, but not as badly. All right. Nonetheless, the southern troops still had the advantage because they knew where everything was. They knew the geography. They knew the lay of the land. And so they could escape in routes that the northern troops never imagined existed. Mm -hmm. And then we did stupid things, like in Antietam, we tried to cross a bridge. We could have waited across that river at many, many different places, but the general says we're going to take that bridge and show them that we are the northern troops. You know how many people lost their lives trying to cross that bridge? Thousands. And they never took the bridge. Mm. And the southern troops just sat up on these ridges and just picked them off as they tried to come across through that one stupid little place. It, it, we, there was sheer idiocy going on yeah. during this war at Arrog all levels. Arrogance. Right. And you remember Andersonville, right? And all the diseases that were intended with that. No, really. No. Wow. Uh, Andersonville is a horrible descriptive book. Um, I'm blocking on the name of the author, but we could look it up. It was a very famous book written about the Civil War and the atrocious conditions of health. Uh, why am I blocking on that name? Just a moment, folks, and we're looking it up. Andersonville, written by... Jared Emick. No, that's a DVD, sorry. Uh, McKinley Cantor. No? Maybe I'm thinking of something else. I'm thinking of Andersonville. Go to the web. Oh, just... A Story of Military Prisons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who wrote it? John Mac McElroy. Does that sound right? It does. Okay, well, he he wrote about Anderson. Well, actually, there are several volumes. Yeah, right. okay. I well, thought there was... John McElroy. There was a fictional book written about Andersonville. Maybe I'm blocking on the name of the author now. It was pretty famous. Yeah, the only ones I pick up are McKinley Cantor and John McElroy. Right. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, it, has a, it has a cannon on the cover, so... Right. <laughs> it was about the Civil War and what went on. There were... Numerous uh, Union troops kept in Andersonville, and they a lot of them died from simple infections, but others died from uh, salmonella and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, at any rate, the conditions were hor uh, horrific. So, having levels. a southern army decimated by not decimated, but affected by yeah. hookworms would make it less effective. Right? Correct, and it it became less and less effect less effective as the war progressed. But this is anecdotal, right? We don't know if this Anecdotal, is true. but nonetheless real. I mean, the, the differences between the northern and southern troops was real, right? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of this was dietary as well. Okay, so fine. Whatever the cause of the end of the Civil War, and then, by the way, just at the last moment before the war ended, Lincoln passes the proclamation. Um, uh, <coughs> Emancipation which, Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, which says, of course, that everybody is free. Free, right. Ha, ha, ha. So the Underground Railroad was very popular during the Civil War anyway. So after the war, now now we're after the war, okay? Mm -hmm. And we know about all the reconstruction efforts in the part of the North to get the South back up economically. and But nothing seems to be working. Nothing. Now it's 20 you, years. Why do you say nothing? How do you measure it? Measured in economic growth. There was no economic growth? In the Zero. South? 20 years after the Civil War, it looked as though the war had just ended. And their main product is, again, cotton, right? Yeah, but, you know, it's interesting because cotton still was king. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, a number of inventions had come along, right? which enabled the Southerners to mechanize their farming. So they were less dependent on labor. That's correct. So they continued to produce cotton. Correct. But not... As in, it Not as wasn't much. growing as much as it should have been. Not as much. And the cotton industry shifted to England and to India and to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. So the cotton from India and Egypt uh, seemed to replace the U.S. cotton anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And they had no choice then to, to sell it to the north. <laughs> and the northern mills began to produce lots more cloth, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But nonetheless, why hadn't the south recovered? Big mystery, right? All of the now Native Americans... I think they need an economic stimulus. <laughs> all of the African Americans headed off into the woods, uh, maybe 90%, mm -hmm. and established small houses in the woods or small colonies of uh, African Americans, mm -hmm. which were, of course, shunned by all the white people anyway because of the prejudice that still existed between whites and blacks. But in many cases, they were healthy people, even though they turned out to have hookworm infection mm -hmm. because what were they eating? They were eating the tops of the plants that the southern people ate. If you had a turnip... Southern gentleman wanted that turnip. Mm -hmm. You could have the top. Of course, the turnip greens contains all the elements of 
good health, all the vitamins and right. iron. The greener the vegetable, the more the iron. Collard greens, iron-rich food. Uh, so the tops are keeping them healthy. Yeah. All right. Their diet is accounting for their um, counteracting the hookworm anemia. Part. But other people had, other than the former slaves, had hookworms. All of the southern owners mm -hmm. and the now mustered out southern troops. They had hookworm. They did. How did the owners get hookworm? Did they wear deerskin shoes also? No, they used to walk around barefoot, too. They had no okay. sanitation either, but they never realized the value of it. Okay, so yeah. so who who noticed all of this? You? No. <laughs> I wasn't alive then, Vince. You know that. Who noticed it? Give, me, give us some clues. Well, there was old man Rockefeller, for instance. Why would he notice this? Because he used to take a trip down to Florida every winter. He would drive? No, a train. Uh -huh. Went right down through the heart of the South. Through South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, <coughs> part of the slave trade. Right. And what did he notice after the Civil War? This is back in the 1890s. Poverty. Everywhere he saw poverty. Mm -hmm. Where there used to be wealth, there's now poverty. And his good friend, Thomas Edison, and his other good friend, Henry Ford, they would vacation together down near Tampa. And they would discuss what's going on here. Comes us. Nobody's paying attention anymore. So Rockefeller decided to take matters in his own hands, and he established the Rockefeller Commission. Mm. It was back in 1902, I think, or 1903. We could look it up. And find this out was the before effect. the Rockefeller Medical, what well, was it called originally? No, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. It was originally called the Rockefeller Commission. Oh, that was the beginning of the Rockefeller. That was, that's right. Okay. So the Rockefeller took some of his multi-millions mm -hmm. and established a commission to investigate why the South had not yet recovered economically. Despite okay. all the reconstruction efforts, sure, there were the scallywaggers and the carpetbaggers and mm -hmm. all those other things, but but what really happened was quite remarkable. The commission went down into the South, and I believe there was a physician associated with this group. Yeah, I was going to ask, what was the composition? Uh, it was mostly businessmen and econo economists, right? Really? How and, could they figure out what was going well, on? Well, they didn't. But they did notice that people were certainly moving a lot slower than the mm -hmm. rest of them. And uh, they weren't terribly interested in anything particular. They would just sit on their porches and wait for the sun to go down and whip out another mint julep. They decided to make their report based around this activity, this laziness, the southern laziness. So they made a report? They did. They we, made a report back to old man Rockefeller. They said, the only thing we can determine is that these people are incredibly lazy. Well, you tell, well, they were never lazy before this. They were pretty active. As a matter of fact, they fought a war for four years. And before that, they were busy in commerce raising cotton like crazy. So something must have happened in the meantime. Why do you think they're lazy compared to other people? I'm just inventing this conversation, but I guess the physician said, well, maybe there's some medical basis for it. He said, you really think so? He says, well, as far as I can see, these people are not healthy. They're pale. They do any medical exams? No. No? He's just looking at them. Just looking at them. Just common observation. Okay. So Rockefeller says, you know, it probably would be worth going back down with a good crack team of medical people mm. and see if we can find out maybe the basis for their laziness. Why so, was he interested in doing this? Oh, Vince. Why do you think? I, um, I, I can only what was think his... that he wanted to make more money than he already had. That's exactly right. I mean, he doesn't have any markets. Rockefeller Foundation was founded around what? 1900? Oil money, you're talking oil about. Oil yeah, oil money. money sure. Did you ever see that movie? No. Let There Be Blood? <gasps> Great movie. Okay, so he it's okay. Wanted so markets. he wanted Got he it. wanted markets and he All wanted right. commerce and he wanted business. And so what he did was he thought, okay, if there's a health reason for this, let's correct it. Down goes the Rockefeller Medical Commission. Where was this commission headquartered? In New York City. So the, the forerunner of the Rockefeller. That's Institute. right. Norman Stoll was on that one. So are there records of the oh, activities of this commission? Are you kidding? There's so, volumes of it. All right, so we can read this. All of it is in print, and it's all fascinating reading. Okay. The bottom line is, of course, that when they did their medical examinations on people, sure enough, they were anemic. Okay. Only the white people. And that's because they fought in the war. Or were the white slave owners or their families. But I don't, I, what I don't understand is why before the war, this wasn't an issue, but 
became an issue after the war because they, they were fighting in, in deerskin shoes. That's it. Well, it became widespread. So the war basically spread. That's right. This infection. That's right. And the reason why I, why I pointed out Andersonville is to show you what horrible conditions existed, not only okay. inside the prison camps but also outside too. Got it. So here we have a revelation that they're anemic. Now you start to look up the causes for anemia in eighteen or in nineteen oh seven. You don't find too many causes for anemia. Not too many. Mm-hmm. But there was this brand new paper produced in Italy by this guy by the name of Dubini. Dubini. Who worked at St. Goddard's Tunnel as the physician in charge mm-hmm. to investigate why so many workers on the St. Goddard's Tunnel had died. Died, Vince. Died. Remember I told you this could be a fatal infection? People were dying inside the St. Goddard's Tunnel. From kind of, this is a tunnel being constructed for something? Between Switzerland and Italy. It still exists. I see. Okay. It was, the, at that time, the world's largest tunnel. Mm-hmm. Five miles. I think it was five miles long or something like that. Imagine digging a tunnel and you're into the tunnel for one mile. And you say, hey, Giuseppe, I'll be right back. I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. You have to walk a mile in right. order to get to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. You might do it. But if you get to the two-mile mark, you'll never do it. And you get to the three-mile mark, you'll ah, so you sure defecate in never. the tunnel. You defecate in the tunnel. And you spread worms. Well, because your feet are being abraded by all the sharp rock that you're creating by blasting it. Well, you're not barefoot. No, but you become barefoot because your shoes become abraded. I see. And you sit down for lunch. Couldn't these worms crawl onto your clothing and find an opening also? Sure. Okay. Sure. So these guys were starting to die, and they were dying from massive GI bleeding. Wow. And when the autopsies were performed, son of a gun. Hookworm. He finds hookworm. In the intestine. Ah, but they're very small. He had to look on no, the you can. No, the adults are oh, visible. Bigger. The adults are visible. So he just looked in the so intestine and found massive And he finds hookworm. these hookworms, and he goes back to the early literature, and he finds out that, indeed, this infection was described in Egypt. Wow. Many, many years before. <laughs> But it, it was never associated with disease. Yeah. They just found them on autopsy or common. So writing. he writes a paper. He writes this paper. And it says in the paper this can cause this worm can cause anemia. And death. And then the rocks and the, the Rockefeller. They pick up this paper and say, Well This is it. Could it be this one? Okay. Well they eliminated all the other things, all right? But not necessarily diet though. The diet did play a role in this because they were yeah. eating iron poor food. But on top of that, they were now shown to be infected with hookworm. And how did they show that? By looking at the feces? Stool. That's right. And, and they, they looked discovered at a number of people and said they all have But hookworm. they discovered it's a new worm, though. It's, a, it's not a worm that's in, it's in Africa. It's a worm that's native to the United States called Nicator americanus. That's what they thought. That's why they named it Nicator americanus. Mm-hmm. But... Later on, it was shown by other parasitologists back in the 1920s and 30s that Nicator americanus also came from Africa. So both worms that we have here came from Africa. There's That's no, correct. There's no and they were brought in by the slaves. There was nothing here before. Nothing here before. Now, wouldn't it well, be as far ironic? as we know, who knows? That, well, you can find out, of course, because I there mean, was no massive outbreaks of anemia before this. Well, you know, there were people living here before we colonized the <laughs> That's U.S. That's true. And they, a lot of them were killed or disappeared. They may have had hookworm. Who knows? Well, well, that's Peter. They, they you know, walked around barefoot. You know? Maybe Peter Hotez knows the answer. Okay, because they did wear very small, flimsy they did. shoes. This is all true. This not is all small, true. but not, I know what you meant. You deer know, skin, deer skin, right, or barefoot. So, that's right. and I don't know where they defecated. Right. Um, that's another problem because they didn't have toilets. They didn't have outhouses. So, well, but you're a, when you're bivouacked and you're a whole army. Yeah, it's easy to see where they would all go to the bathroom, right? Now, that's another thing. They all go to the bathroom over here, and they're there for more than a week. That gives the worms lots of chance to hatch and go into the soil. Yeah, and then as you walk up, well, I'm I'm spoiling the story though, because you don't have to step in the feces to catch the worm. How how far away do you have to step? Well, that was the question that the Rockefeller Medical Commission asked once they found out. What do we know? Did we know how this worm was transmitted? Did Dubini, what's his name? Dubini, did he know? No. And we didn't know either, so no, where, the, where do you go from there? The original papers done in Egypt described the life cycle of the parasite, so we did know how it worked. 
So we knew it would be transmitted from fecal contamination of soil. And then through the skin. Okay. Okay. So what did Rock decide to do? What they decided to do was to investigate, knowing that, are you sure you didn't go over there and when you're barefoot? And I'm sure I didn't, and yet you still caught hookworm. How could you have done that? They concluded that the hookworm larvae can travel in the soil. So they set up an experiment, Vince. They did an experiment. They built a 10-foot in diameter sandbox. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the sandbox, they put human feces <laughs> laden with hookworm eggs. Right. And every day thereafter, and they, they watered this thing every day so that the hookworm larvae wouldn't dry out, they took samples one foot apart from where the stool was deposited out towards the perimeter of this circle of sandbox. Mm -hmm. And they looked for worms. And here's what they found. That was a very clever experiment on their part. They found that on day one, after the eggs had hatched, the larvae are a foot away from the eggs, from the, where the source of the eggs mm -hmm. were. And on day two, they were two feet away. And on day three, they were three feet. And on day four, they were four feet. And on day five, they were four feet. And on day six, they were four feet. And on day seven, they were dead. Hmm. Never got beyond four feet. Never got beyond four feet. How did they find feet. these in the cell? They had to look microscopically, sure. right? Sure, easy. They did a Norman Stoll test. Norman Stoll invented a device for looking. Mm -hmm. That's where that came from. How does that work? It's a little slit. You take, uh, well, there's a whole description of the Norman Stoll uh, larva okay. counter. It picks up larvae in any material that you put in it. Yeah, and it lets them swim out, and then therefore you can see them. They're over here I now. see, okay. So isn't this interesting? Okay, so now you've got this data. That's the data. The data is that hookworm larvae can crawl in soil, and they can crawl for four feet. So I loved asking my medical students this question, because with that amount of information, you can design a control program that doesn't involve drugs or vaccines. And that's totally 100% effective. Mm, I could do that. Yeah, did, and, there, did and there's no it? chance for resistance. Did they get it? No. Oh, that's a pity. <laughs> no, because they were unwilling to think, in this case, inside the box yeah, rather than outside right. the box. That's right. <laughs> so what the solution to this problem was quite simple, right, Vince? Yeah. Because you know the answer. I do. What is that answer? You dig a six-foot deep hole. You do. Where people defecate into this and the worms true. can't reach the surface. This is exactly right because they can only crawl four feet. Yeah. But what if the feces piles up for two feet? Whoops. Now they can crawl the four feet. Yeah, and they we have, get out. then you have to close the outhouse down and move it, right? Right, or you have to keep removing material yeah. and do something else with it, or you have to throw something in there, or let it compost so it dries down. Right. So all of those things could be done, <clears throat> but uh, in some cases they didn't. So whenever they didn't follow the instructions, it became a place to go catch hookworm mm -hmm. rather than get rid of it. Mm. Wow. But if you followed the instructions of how to make a pit privy, you solved your problem. So Rockefeller. Wait a minute. What else did you solve? All, all the other parasitic infections spread by feces, right? And whipworm. No, 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 no. You were right about the parasites. So what are the what are the sanitation? No, well, you can just all the bacterial. Yeah, bacterial infections. All the viral. Well, to if, a certain extent, because you make you a big still, list. You still get the viral diarrheas in other ways. Because always, you always contaminate your hands. Kids always contaminate. They always spread. But you, sure. you get rid of the a bulk of it. I would guess 90% of Cholera, the salmonella. Sure. You know, come on. But Giardia. I want to know how this was implemented. What did Rockefeller said? We now it's to, a political solution after this. Uh, it now becomes politics and sociology. Okay. Because you can't enforce this. Oh, another thing they found out, by the way, in doing their surveys in the South, was the distribution of hookworm. Sandy loamy soils... Always hookworm. Hard pack clay soils, no hookworm. So you start to make maps based on sandy loamy soils mm -hmm. and clay soils, and now you don't have to do the survey. You can automatically assume that hookworm is there until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So guess which service was invented based on that stuff? Which service? USGS. The U.S. Geological Service, really, to map survey. out. Survey, U.S. Survey. Geological Survey. Oh, cool. We then, when we realized that we could map out a disease based on soil type, well, what else, what else can you do based on soil type? Well, in that case, let's have every state survey their state for soil types and wow. give us the map. 
And then wow is right. Based on that, they said you have to put outhouses here. Well, and, they said that, but at that point, then they were looking at farmland and they were looking at uh, all kinds of other geological features that were important for establishing yeah. communities, yeah. etc. So, it, so it was a, a lot low, of good. A low tech solution. A very low tech solution. It's like putting screens on windows. Right. And, all putting, the best solutions putting, are, Vince. Putting covers on water jars. The best so solutions are simple, straightforward, that everybody can do. Well, they go a long way. They do. Yeah. They do. Like for West Nile virus, for instance. Remember, you just clean yeah. up the distilled the the still water. So how many years did it take for the southern population to be rid of this infection? They're the still, they still have it. They still do. But yeah. they're not... Uh, not anywhere near the like the, this. The so they, rec- they were. So when did they start re- economic recovery? Is what I'm asking. It was another ten to fifteen years. And was this monitored medically? No, it was monitored uh, economically. So, so you could actually watch. You, now, what does it do to a kid that's not a not anemic, b doesn't have diarrheal disease every day, and mm-hmm. c hasn't got a sniffly little nose every day? It means they can stay in school, doesn't it? Yes, and learn Bingo. and be productive. So you, that takes a while to show up in economics. Yeah. But the next generation after they installed these outhouses started to exhibit a much different behavior pattern. Much different. Why is there still hookworm in the South? That's a very good question, Vince. You have to ask them. There are some places in the South, particularly in Appalachia, yeah. not all of it even. Poverty. Some places in Kentucky and West Virginia where not, no one trusted anyone. Mm-hmm. The revenues, et cetera, yeah, et cetera, and those areas are still small pockets of infections with hookworm, and another related worm called strongyloides, which we don't have time to talk about today. How many cases, roughly, do we have any idea? Per today, year? yeah, uh, hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand. And in no other part of the U.S. is it an issue? Correct. Well, maybe some parts of the South, like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, maybe mm-hmm. some areas of the rural South. But Appalachia was one of the strongholds for this infection for many So years. without drugs, without vaccines, without surgery, we've ta- we've gotten rid of this infection in the U.S. Sanitation, baby. Just basically sanitation. And so that jump-started the establishment of the United States Public Health Service. It did. It meant that we could do something good at a community level by instituting sanitary methods. Cool. And now, Very what, cool. And what happened to the Rockefeller Commission? The Rockefeller Medical Commission was disbanded. Oh, in the 30s, okay, I believe it was in the 30s. But in the 20s, they were still active, and they got a request from China. China says, we want you to do for us what you did for your own country, because we see the results, and we want those same results. Wow, mm-hmm. what an opportunity. So over to China goes the Rockefeller Medical Commission. I should have brought the book over with me. I actually have a summary of their findings in a very old publication from the American Journal of Hygiene. Mm-hmm. And all of these pictures, it's, they're riveting. I'll, I'll bring it up cool. next time. Um, they went over there and they, they told the Chinese that the answer to their problem was quite simple. All they have to do is dig a six-foot-deep hole right, and put the feces so in the hole. The, they had hookworm in China as Oh, well. tons of it. They still do. In fact, Peter, for many years, was involved in the development of a vaccine for hookworm in China. Why would, a, why would a vaccine be necessary when you can solve it this yeah. way? Why? Well, Vince, it relates to their agricultural practices. They use human feces as fertilizer? Bingo. And that's used in many other parts of the world. So that's, Half. So we still have hookworm in many parts of the world. We do, and other diseases transmitted by human yes. feces as well. Right. So the problem in China was they wanted to get rid of hookworm, but they also wanted to use human feces as fertilizer. Ah, so you had to make a vaccine. Did they make a successful vaccine? No, no, no. They didn't do anything for the vaccine, not in the 20s. So what they did was they figured out a way of fermenting human feces and urine. I see. In these enormous pots, clay pots called kongs, K-A-N-G-S, kongs. And by simply leaving it sit for weeks at a time, the fermentation reaction would eventually generate enough heat to kill off the larvae of hookworm yeah. and strongyloides too. But unfortunately, it didn't kill off much else. 
The eggs of Ascaris, of course, Trichuris, the cysts of Giardia and Eustolitica mm. survive very nicely. I'm sure a lot of viruses do also. And then they take that and, of course, they spread that on their food. <laughs> no good. Then they ship the food to market and everybody catches everything, you know, and it's just, you're right back to where you started. So you said Peter Hotez was involved with a vaccine? He still is. It, it, it's not yet available? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Well, when we get Peter on here, he'll tell us all about that. Okay. We can revisit these issues. So there are no drugs right now to treat this? Oh, there's tons of them. No, 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 I didn't say that at all. In fact, there, there have always been lots of drugs to treat hookworm. So there is a drug called, um, well, one of them, the earliest drug was called tetrachloroethylene. Mm -hmm. Tetrachloroethylene. Doesn't that, sound good. It's not good, but it was very effective against hookworm. <laughs> there was one little thing that tetrachloroethylene did which was riveting. And that was it. It really annoyed the hell out of Ascaris. So you can mm -hmm. imagine having hookworm and Ascaris. Comes out of your mouth, right? And it causes it to migrate. That's right. Yeah. So if you can prove that Ascaris is gone, and then you can use tetrachloroethylene, you're okay. So that's why in the old days, back old days when this was the 70s and 1980s, mm -hmm. we said treat the Ascaris first. If you find Ascaris in a mixed infection... Treat the ascaris first with, in those days, it was called piperazine citrate. Treat it with piperazine citrate. The worm will be paralyzed. It'll go out. Make sure they're all gone. Go back and then start treating with tetrachloroethylene. Today, we have mebendazole. Mebendazole right. treats this infection and ascaris and, at the same time right. without ill effects whatsoever. You just use that. And there you go. So if you there are know. others, too. Another drug called albendazole is a very good mm -hmm. drug. Another drug called TBZ or thiabendazole, an right. older derivative, is good. So there, we have a lot of them. And we have a new, new, new drug called ivermectin. When I say new, new, it's about 15 or 20 years old now, but mm -hmm. that's extremely effective. So that works for hookworm. It hookworm. works brilliantly. Ascaris. Not so much ascaris. No, not so much ascaris. So if you travel to a region with endemic hookworm, you have to be careful. You shouldn't walk around barefoot. <laughs> That's true, you shouldn't. Are there travel-associated infections? Not many. No, you didn't see them here. No. Now, there's a dog infection called Ancelostoma caninum. Uh, it's a hookworm? It is, sure it is. And you can catch it, but you won't get a complete life cycle. You'll just get the larva, and the larva will wander through your skin, causing you great itching and pain. Mm -hmm. That's called plumber's itch. Okay. So that's from a dog. From a dog. But but in endemic areas where you've got <clears throat> Ancelostoma duodenale and uh, Nicator americanus, after you've been exposed many, many times, you develop the same petechiae where these worms penetrate, but they're killed in the skin by a combination of IgE and eosinophils. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you get these uh, blistering uh, pustules. And they've uh, often called that. And where do we get this? Mostly in the rural south. In the U.S. again? In the U.S. No, no, any endemic center will have this. And I mean, you can treat yeah. dogs with some... Yeah, you can deworm them, right? You can deworm them. You can give them mebendazole. It'll work very nicely. And you get rid of toxic caracanus as well. Because we know that in the dog runs... Hmm. Get this. So you, in the northern dog runs, this parasite won't survive. No, it's too cold, too dry. <clears throat> That's right. But right. on the beaches of Puerto Rico yes, and on other beach areas, the worms do very nicely. But mostly it's against the law to take your dog to the beach. This is why. But if you go to Puerto Rico, all of the beaches are public. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. So people take their dogs around. And that's a good place to catch this. Gives you something called creeping eruption. Or plumber's itch. Or plumber's itch. So you you would cut it in the sand because it would burrow into your yeah. hair follicles. But it'll just stay there. And it's coming from the feces of the dog. That's correct. Or the cat. I know. There's a whole world out there that's waiting for us, Vince. Now, people, next time they say, why can't I bring my dog on the beach? You have a good answer for it. But me. here in the Northeast, it's not an issue. Well, it has in some cases been an issue. So my beach uh, here in New Jersey, they have a big sign, no dogs on the beach. Correct. Well, why? it's also, I mean, you Well, you don't what? want feces on the beach either. You don't. But this is not an issue here? Toxicara well, could be an issue, No, right? no the, the Toxicara will just wash away. That'll be gone. The eggs will be gone. But the worms will be right in the, right in the sand. Yeah. So you lay down and you lay on your back, and the next thing you get up, you 
not right away, maybe two or three days later, you've got these serpiginous lesions all over your back. And you go to the doctor. And they, oh, what did you do to yourself? But will they know it's hookworm? Most dermatologists will know what that is. And then is. they'll give you bendazole and you're they, fine? They treat it topically with thiobendazole. Thiobendazole. Topically. Okay. They don't give it to you early. They give it to you as a gauze pad with thiobendazole. And that works? Beautifully. So that could happen here in the north. It's, ha it's happened many times here. And in the south. I've seen it. California? Sure. Everywhere. Everywhere in the U.S.? Everywhere in the U.S. Is it endemic in the dog population? Um, endemic. That's an interesting word. Is it endemic in the dog population? I guess it is. Yeah, we don't bring dogs in from Africa to give them these infections. It's, they've been here. So we need to deworm our dogs. We do. And if there are wild dogs, then that can be an issue. And there are tons of them. So I didn't like Tuxocara cana in no. cat eye, and this doesn't sound good either. But it's not good. This is not going to kill you. No, it won't kill those you. could kill you, right? Mm, no, they won't kill you. There is one though that's related to it that could kill you, it's called Bayless Ascaris procyonis. We didn't talk about that one, but the Bayless Ascaris worm, which is related to the Ascaris of dogs, mm -hmm. produces a much larger worm. You have to go further back yeah. to the aberrant. Well, we talked about infections. it last time. We did. We did. We don't need to revisit it. No. So most of these are not lethal infections, but most of them are more than annoying infections. And hookworm, let me just explain now, in the little time that we have left, if we have any time at all left, I think we've exceeded our limits, but here's why hookworm permanently affects the way you learn. Mm -hmm. That's the most insidious part of this infection. Peter Hotez calls it the world's largest endocrinopathy, meaning that it seems to affect growth rates. Mm -hmm. right? And there's, there's less than a full recovery once your hookworm disease is cured. That's one aspect, but the biggest aspect is the loss of intelligence, basically, the loss of ability to reason, or the loss of ability, however you want to define it. It's measurable. How could hookworm ever affect the way you think? How could that be? Right? I'd like to know. I'm going to try to tell you this, okay? okay? So it's a three-part story. The first part is that it creates an anemia. Okay, so an anemia is the lack of iron. In this case, it's lack of iron. Mm -hmm. Did you know that in your small intestinal tract, on each columnar cell of each villus, there is an, an iron transporter molecule. Did you know that? An iron transporter, I did not know that. Right. But it's not an iron transporter. It's a cation transporter. Mm -hmm. It'll divalent cations and monovalent cations. It'll transport mostly divalent cations. It's not discriminatory. It's non-selective. But it's meant to reabsorb all of the iron that you lose by GI bleeding. Mm-hmm. And you do. You lose a lot of iron this way, and especially in hookworm infection, where you've got GI bleeding all the time. The red cells are being broken down. The iron is being released from the hemoglobin molecule, and what happens to it? It's reabsorbed, it takes back, yeah. which is the way the body conserves these iron mm -hmm. molecules, or atoms, I should say, for reinstitution of a normal hemoglobin synthesis pathway. However, let's say that in addition to iron, mm -hmm. you... Uh, are exposed to lead. Okay. Which is another iron uh, like molecule, right? It's a heavy metal. <coughs> and uh, the, the transporter molecule on the surface of the small intestine will pick lead out of the solution and transport that equally well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, where does lead go? Lead will go all over the body, of course. And now, now Joe Corazziano, my former chairman in environmental health sciences, is a world expert on this. And this, I heard this story from him. Okay. Because he's incredibly interested in arsenic and lead. Right. And its effects on development. Okay, now he used to go to Yugoslavia, the former country of Yugoslavia, to study the epidemiology of exposure to lead from a smelter, which was in a valley... The window was blue in one direction, so you had this plume coming out of the lead smelter, and you had a concentration gradient that was absolutely measurable over the entire mm -hmm. valley. <clears throat> the people living at the far end of the valley were exposed less than the people in the middle were exposed less than the people right up next to it. Wow. So you had, you had a natural occurring 
perfect scenario. And then the next valley over, no lead smelting at mm. all. So you could go down each valley and take samples and use the other valley as a control and find out what the effects of lead poisoning were among all the age groups. And the biggest issue that they found was the ability of school-aged children, the beginning school-aged children, to learn. There was a learning deficit. Hmm. And no matter what happened after that, if they got rid of the lead, it still wouldn't correct. Okay? So that's number two. Lead is associated with neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. And now, the, now number three, story number three. How do we learn? If listeners are sitting here listening to this for the first time and they've never heard any of this and they're interested, their brain is making room for this information by taking all of the connections that are associated with listening and learning and they're disconnecting it and they're reconnecting it in ways that would preserve the information that they've just heard. Okay, so that it's a disconnection and reconnection of neuronal connections mm -hmm. that allows for the... In inclusion of new information into your life on an aside but it's an interesting aside that every day all day long you're accumulating knowledge of the environment that you're looking at and at night when you sleep all those things are dissipate all disappear and the next morning you wake up and you make room for more so here we have this story in a nutshell of hookworm creates the anemia which upregulates the uh, transporter molecule on the surface of the columnar cells which then takes up all divalent cations, including um, heavy metals. Even though they may not be divalent, they'll take up all the heavy metals also. And in goes, if lead is prevalent in the environment, in goes lead along with the iron. The lead <coughs> locates throughout the body, but it also gets into the brain. <laughs> and specifically, the way lead is thought to act by interfering with learning is that it forms a bridge between the two synapses and it doesn't allow them to disassociate mm -hmm. at the same rate. It just stays like a glue and it prevents the synapse from reestablishing on another neuron. What a fascinating story that is because it means that during the maximum period of learning, which occurs during the early school age, children's ages, this is where they learn how to learn. And if they're compromised by the inability to reincorporate new knowledge every day, they're learning at a much slower rate, measurably slower rate. Mm -hmm. So now can you think of all the situations where you would find anemia, in this case due to hookworm, because it's one of the most common causes of anemia, but mm -hmm. malaria is yeah. also a common cause as well. Lead contamination of soil, heavy industrialization throughout third world countries, and learning deficits in most of their teenage population. Well, what about the South, though? Did they have learning deficits? Well, well, <laughs> if they... What are you going to shoot at people with Vince during the Civil War, unless it's with lead? <laughs> They're bullets, there's no... But they had to make it. There were lead factories down Absol there? Oh, tons of them. Everywhere. Because the, the, All over. The, this theory has to... It's, it's true only if there's lead present along with the hookworm. That's right. Right. But so, I can't imagine in Africa where these individuals are coming from, that there are lead factories, especially when the slaves were first being shipped over. No, no, not then. I agree with you. That's, that's But a, during uh, the war. That's right. And after the war, yeah. there was no cleanup. The biggest insult to the environment is war. I mean, look at what happened in East Germany, for instance, mm, after the sure. Iron Curtain came down. So you can find a lot of places throughout the world where there's heavy metal contamination in soil, hookworm infection, and learning deficit. You can find these things together all in the same place. And whenever you do that, then it's obvious that uh, that this may be a major player. Hmm. So, so I'm getting, sure this is being studied a lot. It is. So getting rid of hookworm yeah. gets rid of the anemia. But like I said before, you can actually give iron and get rid of the anemia. You don't have to yeah, get rid I mean, of the hookworm. You can but get, if the lead is still present, you're still going to have problems because that will be absorbed. Nope. Um, at that point, at down right, you won't have to upregulate the transporter yeah, but molecule. Kid eats, kids eat lead and they get lead toxicity. <coughs> no, you're right. You're they don't right. Have hookworm. The moment the moment you start, but it also causes anemia, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they still have issues. The issue is anemia 
upregulates this molecule. Right. It I makes understand. it much more likely for the But there's lead situations in the absence of hookworm where lead is still toxic. That's correct. So I'm not saying that hookworm is the only, the only cause way. for lead toxicity. Okay. But when you pair them up, it's um, powerful stuff. So this is your former chairman who studies lead. And is he interested in the hookworm connection? Um, you'll have to ask him. All right. I'm, I'm just wondering if... I told have... him this story, and he was interested. He was interested in I it. See, yeah. I guess he doesn't work on it. He doesn't work on hookworm, no. But by the way, the irony of this was that he and Peter Hotez were classmates at Rockefeller. Do they know each other now? They do. And so Peter both, Hotez both, is very interested They both in studied this. with uh, Tony Cerami. Ah. Dixon, would you like to do a few emails? Sure. We have one from Luca. Okay. Right. Hi, Vincent Dick. I'm an avid listener of your podcast and TWIV too. I started something like six months ago, and I've retrieved all those whose titles sounded interesting. <laughs> I am not a parasitologist myself, though I am a pharmaceutical computational chemist with a deep interest in biology and virology. My passion for parasitology blossomed upon reading Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer Good. and was restoked by your wonderful podcast. By the way, that book would definitely make for a wonderful pick of the week. I thought we did pick we it. We did pick it, yeah. Please excuse me if my English may seem a bit long-winded, but my brain is wired for Italian, where long, convoluted, interdependent <laughs> phrases are the norm. Not as bad as German. <laughs> and even after 10 years of life abroad, I can't seem to shake the habit. I was listening to your latest when you were talking about the scientists of Antwerp's Tropical Disease Institute and their attempt at fighting El Congolense. Yep. I happen to live in Mechelen, a Belgian city, hmm. halfway between Brussels and Antwerp. One of you, Tube Dick, perhaps, suggested raising zebras and Elon for meat rather than cows in Africa. I believe this is already happening, although in a limited fashion. Africa is probably a bit too far for meat grown there to reach you, or maybe American habits are different. Here in Belgium, it's rather easy to find zebras, ostrich, antelopes, and even crocodile meat in most supermarkets. I'll be darned. The origin is usually South Africa, where I believe they're farmed or at least reared in semi-wilderness. Needless to say, I have tried them all. <laughs> As a native of the Mediterranean island of Sardinia, I am deeply passionate about thin, sliced horse meat quickly roasted on the fire, seasoned with garlic, olive oil, and spicy pepperoncino, or chili, <sighs> as it's known to you. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm probably a very good parasite host, since I like my meat almost <laughs> rare when abroad. I nibble on wild plants from Rwanda to Turkey. What's the point in going to see gorillas if you don't try their wild <laughs> celery? You're not going to catch much by eating that. Thanks so much for your effort in diffusing your knowledge. I'll keep listening and will suggest your podcast to my research group and people in companies who sometimes are hard-pressed to find the time to keep abreast of interesting literature. As for this week in physics, I guess that field is pretty well covered <laughs> by the various nature and science podcasts and the likes of them. What's hard to find, in my opinion is a decent podcast in the field of drug development. Right. Nature runs a couple, but they're sporadically updated, so they don't cut it for me. If you have any suggestions, all the best with your be endeavor. I don't know any podcasts. Why doesn't he start one? Yeah, you should start one, but you probably don't have time. There is a great blog by a, a, a chemist who works for a drug company. It's I think it's called In the Pipeline by Derek Lowe. Ah. And it was a pick of mine on TWIV a few weeks ago. So nice. check that out. Luca. Nice. Nice. Ciao. Nice. Ciao, Luca. Come stai. <laughs> Multibane. <laughs> Multibane. The next one is from, and we'll just read one more. He was very literate, by the way. He wrote a very nice letter. It's very nice. Yes. Thank you. From Deborah. You were going to describe how the Trichurus trichiura causes anemia, not from blood sucking, but you mentioned within the bone, but you never elaborated. Could you explain? I, no, I can't. In fact, we don't know. But we do know that it's probably a bone marrow, a central bone marrow failure, but we don't know what the cause is. Mm, okay. So that's a research project that's waiting to happen. Excellent. Yeah, she continues, I've been using Nicator americanus for my Crohn's disease for good, with good success for three years now. I lose worms within six months, however, and the Crohn's returns. Yes. I recently tried adding Trichuris suisova and had a very negative reaction, which was unexpected. Hmm. You made a few mistakes about Crohn's. Uh-oh. It's not located only to the colon. It can infect the entire digestive tract from mouth to anus. Mm. Ulcerative colitis is colon only. Both are IBD. Irritable bowel disease, yeah. And both trichuris and hookworms are being investigated currently as therapy. Right. 
Thank you for your interesting information and for mentioning the hygiene hypothesis. I learned more about whipworms and would like to hear more about their relationship with allergy and autoimmunity. So there we need to get someone when we move to that phase who can talk about if that. If there is someone. Remember, if these are someone. orphan diseases, and they're, the funding for research on these is really limited. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do a couple more. I'm sorry. Please. This one's from Herbert. I was also able to achieve remission from Crohn's after getting hookworms and whipworms. You can follow right. my progress here, and he has a Facebook page. You put those two people together. <laughs> yeah. And also, there's a wiki page that contains a ton of information on this topic, including helminthic therapy providers. A whole lot of research articles on helminthic therapy can be found here. A right. couple of links. Great. And the last one is from Rochelle. Thank you, Vincent and Dixon, for your fantastic podcast. I am a police officer with a hobby in science. Cool. Australia, trying to squeeze in some study and was in a panic about how I would cram for my microbiology exam next Thursday since work is sending me away for four days. I will be sitting in airports for much of that time, but now I have all of TWIP and many TWIV. I already listened to them all, but will listen over and over while I'm away. I wish you had more on schistosomas and fungi. I love the history you include in your information and also the references to scientists currently working on various things. Vincent asks almost all of my questions. I hope you don't get bored doing these podcasts because I will be a faithful follower from now on. I looked to vote for you in the podcast awards, but you weren't there. I voted for the Brain Science Podcast instead. I'm sure you will be there next year. Love from Rochelle in Canberra. Huh. Um, we, we are not going to get bored. No. Um, and fungi, well, you might try this week in microbiology, which... Will be appearing soon, Twim, and there we'll talk about fungi because we will have people who know about them. Nice. I don't know much. Do you know much about fungi? Well, I had a course here once in medical micro mycology, but it it's yeah. faded into the past. And schistosomes, we will talk about. Of course, we will. Thank you, Rochelle, and thanks everyone for your emails. Dixon, thank you yes. for coming by and doing another twip. You don't have to thank me. I'm part of the scene here, man. Dixon <laughs> de Pommier, Trichinella.org. Medicalecology.org or com. Uh, org. Dot org. And then, of course, verticalfarm.com. Right. Thanks so much. Good to see you. You can find us, of course, on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and at microbeworld.org slash twip. And there is a Microbe World app for your either uh, iOS device or Android device, so you can listen to these on the run if you wish as well. And as always... You can send us questions to twip at twiv.tv or over at microbeworld.org slash twip. There's also a way to leave questions. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. Is parasitic.